from the Oak Ridge or National Lab. So Guanan has very broad interest in many areas of applied mathematics. Uh, is specialized in numerical analysis, scientific computing, uh, PDEs, and recently machine learning and data sciences. So today he's going to talk about uh, generative machine learning models for uncertain quantification. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Yulong, and I'd like to thank Yulong for the invitation and uh, for the kind introduction. So today I'm going to talk about uh, our recent work on you know, generative machine learning models for uncertain quantification. So this work, I first want to acknowledge my sponsor, U.S. Department of Energy, uh, uh, the Office of Science Oscar program, and also thank my collaborators from um, my postdocs at Oak Ridge, my colleagues at Oak Ridge, and also uh, faculty members from Florida State, Auburn University, uh, as well as uh, scientists at NOAA. Okay. So generative model, people are very familiar with generative model. So in general, like a uh, what generic model does is to is uh, is to kind of learn how to create a data samples to uh, replicate a given data distribution. So there are several types of generic models, and uh, we all know there are variational autoencoders, generative adversarial networks, uh, normalizing flows, and the diffusion models. So a little bit of history of generic model, like a variational autoencoder was proposed way before. Uh, the modern GPU architecture was established and used for AI. So that's the has the longest history for like uh, image reconstruction or uh, unsupervised learning and for generating images. And uh, but uh, we all know in for generative model for autoencoders, even even though the architecture is simple and uh, the training is relatively simpler than the other models, but the quality of generated images are not very high. That's why people, after we have more powerful uh, GPU architectures, people are looking for more uh, powerful generative models that can generate more uh, realistic and diverse images or text. So that's why in uh, around uh, 2013, 14, like people developed a generative adversarial network, which significantly pushed up the quality of the generated images, but also comes with the drawback of uh, uh, difficult in training. So it's very difficult to train generative adversarial networks. And at the same time, a more uh, of the more mathematical approach like you based on optimal transport or transport models are pro were proposed, which is the normalizing flow models. And uh, the training of the normalizing flow model is very simple. We just use the change of variable formula to formulate a loss function, which is also unsupervised learning. The good thing about normalizing flow, it has a good mathematical foundation and uh, the training is much easier compared to generative or adversarial networks. But also the drawback is that the quality of the generated image is not as good as the generative and adversarial networks. So for quite a long period, I think from 2015 to 2020, so roughly speaking, so both GAN models and normalizing flow models a lot of people are working on both and uh, try to advance the CPU art until the diffusion model was used, start being used uh, in generative models. Uh, because diffusion model as a probability concept, it, it was developed a long time ago, but, uh, but it was started in, used for image processing problems. I think there are some early work, you can go back to 2015, 16, but it's get really popular around 2020 or 2018, I'm, I don't remember exactly the year, but uh, you start seeing successful applications of diffusion model in denoising, in painting, uh, or um, image generation, a lot of image processing tasks. And after a diffusion model is proposed, it can generate, in terms of quality, I think it can outperform generative adversarial networks in a lot of applications, not all of them, but in a lot of applications, and uh, also can outperform normalized flows. And also, it's much easier to tr uh, the training process is relatively easier than generative adversarial networks. So that's the reason I think why we see um, many many diffusion model papers these days. But uh, so, what is our perspective? So this here are the simple like uh, overview of. Uh, applications of generative models, including image generation, text generation, and data augmentation. But there are also a lot of challenges associated with the generative models in those accomplished those tasks. But our perspective is different from the traditional tasks 
in of using generic model because in their settings, for example, in image uh, generation, they care about the quality of each individual sample as an image. They care about the quality means the, the reali realism and the diversity of the generated samples. So, but the generic model usually is a statistical method. For statistical method, we usually care about the statistics of the, uh, some statistical metric to measure the quality of the generic model. So that's why we think generic model is a, is a better method for a certain quantification instead of, uh, I mean, besides image generation or text generation. That's why we are interested in this topic. So in this talk, I'm gonna touch a little bit on those topics. Like the first one is we, we come up with some diffusion models for sampling high dimensional distributions. Uh, we propose a totally different strategy based on a training free diffusion model architecture uh, without learning the score function using neural network model, for example, which are the common strategy people use in image generation or computer vision tasks. And we extend that, we, have, we consider two settings. The first one is we are given a set of samples of the target distribution, which is relatively simple. And the second one is we consider the, we, we don't have access to the samples of the target distribution. Instead, we have, uh, we can evaluate the probability density function of the target distribution, which is the common case people consider in Bayesian inference, like if you use MCMC as your sampler. And we can extend those strategy to conditional diffusion models to, to for probabilistic inference, like uh, when we learn stochastic dynamical system, learn the time stepping scheme of the stochastic dynamical system uh, from step n to step n plus one instead of a deterministic map is a conditional probability. And we can also apply this to uh, learning static Bayesian inference to sample from posterior distribution, for example. And the next one is to move from the static Bayesian to dynamic Bayesian or recursive Bayesian, which is the data simulation problem. And in this setting, we also use the training free strategy to be able to track very, very high dimensional dynamic systems, like a high dimensional and chaotic dynamic systems. And we try to apply our methods to some benchmark uh, atmosphere and ocean uh, dynamic systems. Okay, so we start from the first topic, which is the simplest one, the supervised learning of generic model for just the height of sampling. So this is setting is very simple. You have a targeted random variable X and you, you follow some distribution. You don't know this distribution, but instead you are given a set of samples of X as your information, as your training data for example. And what you want to do is to build this prime trust generic model or generator, which is the function map or transform map F from some standard Gaussian random variable to the target random variable. And this F is prime trust by the random by the vector parameter theta. So what you wanna do is try to find the best theta that such that once the theta is found, you can generate the samples from the standard Gaussian, which is Y, and then push through the map to get samples of X. That's all you need. And to do this, in, in normalized flow, people want to use some reversible architecture to define F because they don't have label data for training. You need to train it in the unsupervised way. But in fact, if you have label data, you don't need F inverse, you just need F. That's all you need for generating samples. So that's why the objective here is, as opposed to unsupervised learning that people use, we want to develop some supervised learning framework to generate, to construct this generator F. And this label data is generated by the training free diffusion models we're gonna propose. Okay, a little bit about diffusion model overview. So diffusion model is, has two stochastic processes, the forward process and the backward process. And the forward, it's a, the forward process is an OU process. It can, <coughs> with the property, it's a linear in, linear in, the, in, the, in the drift term. So with the property selected B and uh, sigma, B and sigma only depends on T, not depends on state. It can transport any targeted distribution to the standard Gaussian. You need to train it. You can just choose. For example, we usually use this set of uh, uh, selection definition of the coefficients. Just do that. If you look at it carefully, you can easily find out you can have transport any target distribution to the standard Gaussian. And, uh, but that's not what you need because this is transport the target to the standard. You need it the other way, in the other direction. So which is the backward SD. 
they use the same B and sigma, but they have another term, which is the score function. If you know the score function, you can first generate uh, samples from standard Gaussian and solve the backward SD in time to get the samples of the target distribution and then the mission accomplished. But the problem is that you don't know it. So the definition of the score function is the gradient of the log of the Q of ZT, where Q is the solution of the focal point equation so associated with the forward SD. So you have the forward SD, there is a corresponding focal point equation, the logarithm of the, the solution of the focal point equation and the gradient, that's the score function. So, but you don't know that because you are only given a set of samples of the target distribution. And the target distribution is the initial state of the forward SD. Uh, and the standard Gaussian is the terminal state of the forward SD. Okay, so the key task in diffusion model is to learn or approximate the score function. And in uh, AI community, the, they usually use a machine learning model like a neural network. Uh, in image processing, people usually start using like UNet kind of architectures to learn such score function by first solving the forward SD, to, forward SD to generate all the path information. So you can use the path information and the formula the loss function to learn the score function. That's what you already been done in AI, uh, in the machine learning community for image processing problems. But we want to do it in a different way because we found out that it's a common, I mean, it's a well-known formula, but no one used that in uh, AI models to, to learn the score function is that, you know, the score function has an explicit formulation you can write it out as a conditional probability. And here, this is the conditional distribution given Z0 for fixed Z0. And because the forward SD is the OU process, this conditional distribution is always a Gaussian distribution. And the Q0 is the distribution of your target random variable, which you don't know Q0, but you know the samples of Q0, QZ0. So basically, if you, with this formulation, you can take the gradient inside, the gradient is with respect to ZT. And you can just, uh, because you know QZT conditional on Z0, you can write, it out, write out the gradient ex explicitly, which the score function boils us onto this form. And you have this weight function, which is also written as an as a, as a expectation. So and the integration of the, of the weight function equal to one as well. And with this formulation, you can directly approximate the score using Monte Carlo samples, if you have uh, samples from the target random variable, which is, what, which is your, what do you have? So basically that's what we do. So at any time and spatial location, you want to, to approximate the score function, you just substitute, you just substitute the samples of the target distribution into this Monte Carlo estimator to approximate the score function directly. When you solve the backward SDE, yeah. It looks like it's an order n square computation. Huh? So if the computational cost might be high, right? Because for every location, if you want to evaluate the score, you mm -hmm. need to do a sum of n. Yeah, the cost is high. It's a, that's, the, that's the bottleneck of the, of the computational cost. You need to perform a matrix matrix multiplication. Uh, and uh, the size is like uh, the number of uh, samples you have times the number of samples you want to generate. Right. So and you also number of dimension. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. That's right. You can do you can do some uh, simplification for like using a subset or mini batch to do it. Uh, but I agree that's the, that's the bottleneck. Uh, it depends on what you what do you need or what do you want. That's why we need to do a supervised learning because this current strategy is just for you to generate label data. Oh. And after you need to train the neural network. After training a neural network, you don't need to do this anymore when you generate new data. Okay. And that's a very good question because here it is. It is the, the, bottom, the computational burden here, but uh, on the other hand, it's very easy to scale this on multiple GPUs because it's just a simple matrix linear algebra. So it compared to you parallelize, uh, you know, you are now training doing, using data parallelism and all this stuff. It's, it's, this is much easier to do, but, but I agree. That's, that's the bottleneck. That's 100% that's right. Okay. Now you have this training free architect uh, strategy to approximate score, basically, you can direct it. You don't even need to solve the forward SD. You can solve the backward SD only. Start by generating samples from the from the targeted from the Gaussian distribution, and then solve the backward SD to get one sample of the target distribution. 
But that's not good enough to get the data labeled because this is the SDE transport. You can see what we want to get is a smooth radiation function relationship between the initial state and the terminal state of this flow map. But if you solve the SDE, apparently there's no such kind of smooth relationship because it's all stochastic. And this is reverse time SDE. And this is the corresponding fork plan equation. By simply using the formula like uh, you know the gradient of this p equals to pt times the gradient of log pt, you can convert that to a Louisville equation, and the Louisville equation corresponds to this reverse time OD, which there's the one half here, but you remove this stochastic term, and the, if you plot the path of the OD, that's the path of the OD system, and this one, if you look at the initial state and terminal state, each of them for each path it formulates a very nice pair of label data. So that's, that's why we, when we generate the label data for training the generator, we don't solve the SDE, we solve the backward ODE. We, I mean, the distribution of this path at each time step is the same as the distribution of the fork plan equation, but the path is different. And now it's simple. So we can just uh, first generate a bunch of samples from the standard Gaussian. For each of them, we solve the backward ODE to get the initial state. And then we take the initial state and the terminal state, put them together as a pair of data. That's well, one of the pair of data, uh, label data. And you can generate a lot of them. Of course, this generation is like what you said, it uh, involves a matrix multiplication, which is expensive. That's why once we generate those label data, we can train a very simple neural network, like fully connected, uh, you know, uh, using the MSE loss, which is much easier to train, to train the generator. Once the generator is trained, you, you can generate an unlimited number of samples very fast without any, without solving the ODE anymore. So that's, the, that's why we need to still train a neural network to do to, to as the final generator, uh, you know. So here is the illustration of how these samples look like. At the bottom, those are the benchmark problems in 2D that people usually like to use to, test, to benchmark or evaluate the performance of uh, generic models. So those are the real data set, the density function of the real data set, the ground truth. And in the middle are the label data we generated using the backward ODEs. You can see the label data is not the same as the ground truth, it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's slightly different. And, uh, and on the top are the samples generated using the trend neural network based on the, the label data in the, in, 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 in the middle. We can only use the label data to train the neural network because that's the only time we have a smooth function relationship between the targeted random variable and the standard counts. We have this. So it's very nice. It works fine. And we test now some UCI data set, those tabular data that people usually use. Uh, there are some eight dimensional data. There are some, I think the, the biggest one is the 43 dimensional data. The data are not perfect and they're not very, very big. So we can only measure. I mean, it's very hard to, to, uh, to uh, visualize. So we just plot some random marginal distributions. And we also plot this, uh, uh, the label data, the mean and the KL divergence and the, the mean and the standard deviation. So roughly speaking, it's, uh, it's, uh, we see a good uh, agreement between the, our generated model and the true data set. So here, we don't have the targeted distribution of the, of the, uh, the probability density function of the target distribution, we only have a data set. So that's what we tested. Okay, until now, what do we assume? We are firstly given a set of samples following the target distribution. So what if we don't? We only have access to the probability density function of the distribution, which is the traditional Bayesian setting. What do we do? And in this setting, usually we assume we can draw samples from the prior, but the posterior distribution usually is pretty different from the prior distribution. And a simple strategy to, do, to, to extend our previous method to this setting is to incorporate important sampling in the score estimation because score is just nothing more than uh, an expectation. And uh, we can just simply do a, uh, you know, have this proposal distribution of QZ0, and this is the posterior distribution, for example. If we can have a good proposal distribution that we know how to draw sample from, then this score estimation will be effective. And uh, 
And then in this case, we can draw a sample from the posterior distribution, okay? And then in terms of uh, important sampling, the most important question is the ratio. We need to have enough effective samples. Effective meaning we can draw a sample from QZ0, but we need to compute this ratio. And this ratio, if it's small, for example, if too many samples with very small ratios, which means those samples will not contribute to the final approximation, which is bad. We need to make sure the proposal distribution QZ0 is as close to the posterior as possible. I mean, there are a lot of methods you can use, annealing, large man dynamics, MCMC. I think here is the only difference is that when we use those methods, we don't need this method to, to converge to the posterior. We just don't need this method to give us the proposal distribution or set of samples of a proposal distribution that is close enough such that we will have a sufficient number of effective samples when we, uh, when we approximate the score. So this relaxation is very important, especially for complicated uh, you know, uh, probability distributions. Like if you have multiple modes of the posterior of the distribution, usually letting those mark, mark of chance hopping around different modes properly, that's a very challenging task in high dimension still. And we, if we don't, we, and in this case, we probably we don't need that. And also there's another thing we need to look at here is that to compute the ratio, you need to know the PDF value of the proposal distribution, which we already don't know. So what we do is once you run, let's see, once you run MCMC or needing or Langevin dynamics to get samples of this QZ0, we can go back to this supervised learning diffusion model framework, use that sample to generate, to generate, to, to establish a generator a generative model just for the proposal distribution. And with this, with this uh, generator constructed, we can use this change of variable formula that is exactly the same as the normal and flow training loss. We use that to define or to evaluate the PDF value of the distribution that is defined by this generator. So in this way, we not only have the capability to draw a sample from a distribution that is close enough to the posterior, we'll also be able to evaluate the, the, the exact density function. And there's no error because this density function is defined by this, by this generator. We get this generator first and then we compute the density value. So there's no, uh, no error in there, no uh, model error in there, okay? So in this way, we can handle the case that uh, we are given a posterior density function, we can query it, but we don't have a set of samples from the posterior, <coughs> that, which is the extension of our previous work. So here is the additional test samples that usually the normalizing flow or generative model people like to use. Basically you can turn any image to a 2D density function, uh, and then you can try to learn this, to generate samples from this 2D density function, try to see if you can mimic you can reproduce this image. That's the simple, uh, 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 interesting way to test this, uh, the quality of the generative samples. And we compare with Metropolis algorithm, which is MCMC. And uh, this is, I think this is a neural spline flow, uh, neural spline flows, which is one type of normalizing flows. And, and also this one plus the Metropolis. And uh, we can see our method can replicate the target distribution very well, even for some very small architectures. So this is the 2D test. And here is the 10D test for some bimodal, uh, but multimodal distribution. Here we can see, we call it a double well uh, potential uh, distribution. So we have a total of eight different modes in the eight dimensional space. And uh, at the bottom, this, lower triangular, those distribution are the marginals from the proposal distribution we learn uh, using a kneading uh, uh, approach. And then we use this samples as the proposal distribution to train the uh, uh, supervised learning generator and use that to define the, uh, the PDF <coughs> and use important sampling, try to learn the final, the target distribution, which is much sharper you can see than the, uh, than the proposal distribution. And, uh, we can do it with our current strategy. Yeah. What is the proposal distribution? 
we don't know the probability distribution is is defined by a neural network. So we first use a kneeling. So the the prior distribution is, uh, for example, is a is a, is a uniform distribution in uh, in uh, in ten D. That's where we start, and we use a kneeling strategy to to generate those samples first in the lower triangular, and based on those samples, we can train uh, using our training free diffusion model to label data, train the generator. Then we have a generator to generate these proposal distributions. So it sounds to me, because I was thinking that uh, you want to generate samples from your, post, uh, from your posterior distribution, yeah. it's hard. It's and then, then you, you, you sample from say, um, your, your, your proposal distribution. There are two stages. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, but it looks to me that sample from the proposal is as hard as sample from the posterior. So the only thing that you get from here is that uh, you 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 just look you just use your proposal distribution as an important sampling strategy to Yeah, we decompose exactly. We decompose the challenge into two two steps. The first step you need to run MCMC, a kneading or Langevin dynamics to generate the proposal distribution which is what we want is that we want the distribution close enough to the to the to the, to the, to the posterior, posterior, but we don't need convergence. Okay. Especially for the multimodal distribution, you have two modes. For example, one mode is 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 has a lot of has a big volume. The height is different. Think about the two distribution. The height is different. Mm -hmm. One mode is uh, is has the seventy percent <coughs> of the volume. The other mode has thirty percent of volume. Uh, usually, if you run a Monte Carlo or MCMC or Langevin in high D, sample those two modes with the proper Volume ratio is hard, mm -hmm. but here we don't need that. We so can proposal well proposal don't don't need to respect that. Okay. As long as we capture those two modes, then we can just uh, use the imp the important sampling will fix the okay. mode ratio. So we kind of uh, decompose the challenge into two steps, uh, not requiring the convergence of of the proposal distribution to the posterior is 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 good. Is 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 very important in this in this uh, in this approach. Otherwise, they are the same pretty much, right? You already solved the uh, you already solved the uh, get samples of the target. Then why bother, right? So I think that's the difference. Yeah. Also, why do we need a labeled data set? I mean, you 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 are interested in generation, right? So it, it, the, the goal. Yeah, you need a label data because the final eventually you want to train a generator model which is similar. And small model instead of you for for each sample you to solve a backward ODE. My understanding is that you, 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 the transform map is defined by the ODE map. You yes. Only flow, right? Yeah. So it's from the Gaussian to the target distribution. Yes. So as long as you have that flow, right? Mm -hmm. You don't actually need the the, the latent Gaussian samples, right? To to do something, you the only thing you need is the transform map. Yeah. yeah so. <clears throat> the transform map is defined by this ODE, but uh, if you don't train a generator to map from Gaussian directly to the target, you for each sample, you need to solve the ODE from here to here, which is time consuming. That's why in diffusion models, people are talking about like how to speed up the uh, reverse time ODE or SDE solving using exponential integrator or parallel in time or these strategies. So, so, your, so your transfer map is not it's not solving the ODE. It's no, it's just a directed map. That's why we want to create a label data. Basically, it's an initial term condition, terminal condition of this path, not create a label sample. So, so you want to know which latent latent variable is corresponding corresponds to, to which time. which so then yeah. You some generator or something. Yeah, we train a fully connected neural network, mm. two layers or one layer, directly map like a function, directly map from here to here. So that's a, you save you the time of solving reverse time ODEs when you really need to solve to generate new samples, and you can store that model somewhere. It's very small, and uh, you know, uh, that's the that's the point. Uh, otherwise, you need to keep all the data. I mean, learning a score function is also <laughs> ready to once you have the score function, you don't need to use the keep the data anymore, right? You, you, you absorb all the information into the score function, but the score function also training the score function need to keep use all the past information. But here we only need to use the to the initial terminal state. So that's, that's the, I think that's the key, key computational gain in, in generating this. I mean, for this, uh, so especially for patient inference of this, once you have, 
And once you have this generator in hand, then you, you can generate an unlimited number of samples. Very, very, very efficiently. Okay, so that's for the Bayesian inference problem, which is the second one. And now, then, then we can easily extend the distribution, learning a static distribution to learning conditional distributions. Okay, so basically, if we have, if we're still in the Bayesian setting, and now we assume our observation can vary. It's like a mortised inference. The, 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 the observation Y can vary. And can we learn such conditional distribution? So a very, we can still use this training-free strategy. It's basically we need to add a likelihood in the score estimation when we, do, when we uh, solve the reverse time ODE to generate the label data. And the generator itself will have another input which is the which is the observation which is the conditional variable besides the standard Gaussian learning variable. Okay, so here is the score function for the conditional diffusion model. Basically, you just need to add the likelihood function somewhere here. Yeah, add the likelihood function in the in the weight when you you it's pretty much the same score expansion, but you need to add the likelihood function in there uh, when you train the score because score also depends on the conditional variable. You still have the Monte Carlo estimator, and here's, here's what how we use it to solve inverse problem. For example, this is a toy example. You have y equals to x square with a, with random noise and x from minus two to two, and uh, this is the samples that we generated using this formula. And what we wanted to do is to see to solve the to quantify the conditional probability given y of x. Basically, for given y, we have a bimodal distribution. That's the distribution we want to handle. And then this is the map. This is the label data we generated by adding uh, the random the, the observation data as another input of the diffu of the generative model. So we have the, the input of generative model have so the label data have three data sets. This is the standard Gaussian. One of the this is the targeted random variable sample. This is the standard Gaussian, and this is the the conditional random variable, and they become a three D, uh, a, a three dimensional, a two dimensional function for this one D uh, approximate one D model. We have the two dimensional uh, surface. We want to use a neural network to approximate. Once we do that, for each observation data value, like each Y here, here, and here, and we just put in the standard Gaussian samples, so we can generate the samples of the from the conditional distribution. Here are the two. Conditional distribution. Why is that? Y equals one. Why is that? Y equals two point two five. So you train the model, generative model once. You can generate the conditional distribution for different, uh, different uh, observation data, which is the people call it a amortized, amortized inference. Okay, and we can extend that to learning SDE model to learn the transition probability of SDE models. Here, basically, the conditional model is just say. For given the current state, what is the probability distribution of the next state of the SDE model? And we use the same strategy. Here is the way we apply this to the OU process, basically to learn the transition probability. We, we, the training data here is generated the first by solving this SDE from zero to like to one or to two. And we have a bunch of uh, path, paths and we cut the paths into smaller, like, uh, you know, smaller pieces, like what we usually do when we train uh, LSTM, for example. And we stack them together, use that as the training data to train the conditional transitional, conditional distribution with the transition probability distribution associated with SDE. And uh, we try to use that to, to do the time stepping uh, of the SDE model. This plot is the mean and the, and the, the standard, and the mean plus and minus the standard deviation of this whole process. And those are the, Recovery of the of the uh, you know the drift and the diffusion coefficient. Okay, and here is another one using our strategy to learning SD, which is double well potential uh, problem. You can see there are two modes, and here is the learning uh, drift term. Uh, drift term. Here is the learning const, uh, diffusion term, and here are the distributions of X at the different time instances. You can see there's a multimodal distribution that we, once we learn this transitional probability distribution, we can just keep propagating 
using that as the time stepping scheme to propagating to generate samples of any state in any time. So here's another example of a 2D oscillator. Basically it's still OU process, but we have one is an isotropic transport along one direction. It's like a delta function that the, 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 there's no diffusion. You can see along the other one, there is a diffusion and we can also learn this dynamics pretty pretty well. How many data do you need to train this? Here is pretty, pretty a large amount because even though it's 2D, because every time you worry about it, you want to use machine learning model to do time stepping, you need to worry about the, the error accumulation. That's why we need a lot of data, like millions of data, even for this. Like uh, we, we sample from, we generate the path from zero to two, for example, with the various initial conditions. And then we, for example, we use the time step like delta like 0 0.01, and then we start chopping them into the smaller pieces and we stack them together. I think that when, once we stack all everything together, it's like a two or three million like samples. Yeah, so. Okay, so here is another example, but we just apply that to uh, real like uh, climate models to do this uh, model calibration. They have, they have uh, eight parameters. That they want. It's, a, it's a land model in this uh, E3SM models that developed by DOE about earth systems. So this is just a, a demonstration of how our method compared with the MCMC method. We can see this is, there's no, I do admit, so there's no exact solution. So we, all we can see is our method produce something similar to MCMC, but we, we still don't know if MCMC give us the correct answer. So there's no way to check. It's just a, it's just a, 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 a simple demonstration here. But the, the good thing is with this, uh, once the generator is trained, the number of sample, uh, the sampling efficiency is much, much improved uh, than running MCMC or other uh, sampling methods. Okay, now we move on to the next stage. Before we are talking <laughs> about static sampling, now we jump to the dynamic sampling, basically it's the, for data simulation. In this setting, the most difficult part is that our distribution is evolving because the, as we incorporate the more and more streaming data along the way. So data simulation is that we want to track this dynamical system. This is a target system. And here is the, but this target state is not observable, not observable directly. You need to observe it, a function of this state with some noise. And the state system also has some noise, which models the error. And we want to sample from the conditional distribution or the posterior distribution, conditional on the observation data from the beginning to the current time. So, so, the data simulation requires repeating the implementation of uh, Bayesian sampling or Bayesian inference. So that's the hard part. The reason why we need this simulation is because if we don't need, if we don't use that, the model will, the model error will accumulate, accumulate more and more then it will go off to completely from the ground truth. And with the observation data gradually assimilated into the model prediction, we can kind of keep tracking the, 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 ground, the, the, the true, uh, the true uh, dynamics. That's why we need data simulation. And the data simulation usually is divided into two steps every time we have new observation data. The first step is to probably, is a pre we call the prediction step. Basically is we take the samples from the prior iteration and push through the forward model, which is the state equation to get the samples of the current time step. This, this is nothing fancy, just to push through the forward model, uh, the state equation. And the, the challenging part is the update step which is to incorporate the information of the new observation data observed, uh, collected at the current time step, and the light, which corresponds to the likelihood function. The prediction step gave us a prior, and, but the, how to incorporate the likelihood function is, is challenging. Okay, and uh, so the state of art, one of them is particle filters. Basically you use a set of samples to describe the current distribution, but uh, Particle distribution, particle, uh, particle filter has a disadvantage of degeneracy. Basically, they need to do a resampling every time they incorporate the observation data. In high dimensional space, those degeneracy issues will cause the divergence of the particle filter. So particle filter can handle 
very nonlinear models, but not very high dimensional models. And the, the other on the other side is the is the ensemble comma filter. Ensemble comma filter is, is very good at uh, high dimensional but linear models. They can handle very high dimensional problems as long as it's linear. Because when the models are all linear, you transform a Gaussian to another Gaussian. So the, everything becomes easier. And that's that's the reason why ensemble common filter is the main workforce in in today's weather forecasting uh, centers. They use that to provide initial condition of their weather models to do real forecast because they can handle uh, high dimensional problems. And they can handle with property implementation, it can handle uh, a, a some kind of, to some extent, the nonlinearity uh, by doing called a localization. But that's, we are, we're gonna show that's a very sensitive approach uh, to tune this ensemble common filter to handle those uh, nonlinear problems. Now, the, our idea is we want to use the score function to describe the <coughs> dynamics of the posterior, of the posterior distribution, the evolution of the posterior distribution. And that score function, so in this case, we need to keep updating the score function. So our first idea to see we, 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 we had is to do score matching, basically using neural network to learn score function to see how it works. It worked, but uh, the time cost is very high because we need to keep retraining the neural network to learn the score function. That's the first uh, approach we proposed. Basically, just to use the score to learn the distribution, the posterior distribution. And every time we have new observation data, we retrain the score. Yeah, so these are the, the basically the, the details about how we implement the, let me see how much time I have here. Okay. So, yeah, so that's, that's how we implement this, uh, this score function. And uh, yeah, the score, the score models are trained with deep neural networks. And it works fine. Let's see. So basically, the idea it can be described by this flow chart, right? Here is the real time propagation of the filtering. Like you have the time, this is the time for the dynamical system. And here is the pseudo time, which is the diffusion model going through. And every real time, we have the posterior distribution from the previous time. We know the posterior score. And then we make the prediction, get the prior score. And then we try to incorporate the likelihood function to get the posterior score for the next time step. And then we keep doing this over and over. But every time, each, each, each iteration, we need to retrain the score function uh, using a neural network, which is time, very time consuming. That's why we, didn't, we cannot go very high dimension. But we can still <laughs> use that to do some simple test, like a bearing only tracking problem is a very simple test for nonlinear, uh, but the low dimensional uh, dynamical systems. Here we have a very highly nonlinear arc tangent uh, observation function. And uh, we compare that our score based method. This is the ground truth. Our score based method with uh, uh, particle filter, augmented particle filter, and ensemble common filter. And you can see because of the nonlinearity, it's well known that ensemble common filter will go off. Even in such a low D problem, because of nonlinearity, ensemble common filter will not work. But the particle filter is the perfect solution for this type of problem. That's why we can see our method works as well as particle filter in this low D but highly nonlinear problems. Now we go to a high D and also nonlinear problem, which is the Lawrence 96 model. In uh, here, uh, I think we tried in the 100 D in this first paper because we. We cannot go very high division because of the cost of retraining the score function. But we can still see a pretty big nonlinearity here in, in the, in the uh, observation model. And uh, the, of course, the path, the, the path is very chaotic. And uh, sorry, whoops. Yeah, we compare also with the, with the particle filter, the augmented particle filter with a somewhat common filter. And we can see our method can do a very good job, but the particle filter completely failed because its dimension is too high. And the, even though it can handle nonlinear problem, but when the dimension is high, it's failed. And the ensemble common filter completely off because of the nonlinearity the, in the observation. So our method can handle. The reason why we plot them separately because just the scaling, we cannot just put the ensemble common filter in here. We want to illustrate 
the, dis the difference, the error of our, between our method and the ground state. That's why we need to plot that with the uh, zoom in version. So that's the first paper that we wrote about this using score to learn the for data simulation. We use neural network to learn a score function, but but later we say, okay, since we have this training free strategy, why we use that to approximate score directly without training anything? In this case, we don't even need to train the generator like what we had before. We just uh, using the training free score estimator to incorporate the new likelihood function. So the critical step is still we have this, uh, you know, this expansion of the score function as what we showed at earlier in the talk. And this is used to learn the prior scores, like the prior score. And uh, the likelihood score, this is the key thing in, I think why our method works, because the likelihood score is added to the prior score using this analytical form. Here we assume we have, we know the, or we can evaluate the gradient of the log PDF or log likelihood, because we, I mean, if we don't know it, we can try to build a separate model to do that. If we know this, then we have this uh, uh, coefficient and this damping function, which the damping function is equal to one for tau equal to zero. You see at the initial state, we have the full log likelihood of plug, plug the prior score, but when it's equal to one at the terminal state of the diffusion model, the HT equals to one, it equal to H tau equals to zero. Basically that will not affect the terminal distribution is a standard Gaussian. And during, you can view that as during solving the reverse time SDE, we gradually incorporate the information from the data into our samples. And such that we can transform the score from the prior to the score from the posterior. The score of the posterior is just the score from prior plus the score from all the likelihood. And uh, this part is important because during this part, we don't need to do any high dimensional approximation. What I mean is, if you think about what a sample comma filter does, each, each time they need to update the mean and the covariance matrix using an ensemble. And the, that process is literally a high dimensional approximation, which, is, which will introduce errors. And also because that's in, based on linear assumption, that will have some model structure errors. And if you think what particle filter does, the resampling strategy is essentially you use the empirical distribution to approximate the target distribution, and then you do the resampling. And that approximation is also a high dimensional approximation, which causes the degeneracy issue. But here, when we incorporate the information from new data, it's analytically incorporated. There's no high dimensional approximation. I don't think we are beating the curse of dimensionality. We just avoid doing high dimensional approximation in this, in this setting by when we incorporate the observation data into the, into the score function. Okay, so with this training free strategy, we can really push it to high dimension. And here we can easily do a 100 dimensional test. And this is just some benchmark test problem. There's no, no I mean, because you already see the, the previous test, there's no surprise here. And uh, you know, the, the, the generation, you know, for this 100D or 200D, it's better than, than a somewhat common filter, but it's not uh, that impressive yet. But the error, of course, is better. What we really uh, want to show is the highly, high dimensional and highly nonlinear examples. So this is a Lawrence 96 with the arc tangent observation. This observation is highly nonlinear because <coughs> once your state is outside minus pi, half pi and the plus half, half pi, you don't have any information. You only get information when it's in the region. It's like, when, it's, it's like when you use a radar to detect object, if the object is very far away from you, the, the radar can only detect the angles. The angle, the angle will, is, the location is not very sensitive. The angle is not very sensitive to the location. That is the, that's the, what, what's behind this. So why we use arc tangent uh, as, the, as, the, as the observation function. So this is highly nonlinear. And here we try one million dimensional Lorentz 96, so literally one million dimensional uh, chaotic system. And uh, here is what we do is out of the 1 million, we have a ground, two states like paths, trajectories. And uh, 
we randomly selected for each figure, we randomly selected three states out of a million dimensional states, and we plot the path. And to, to visualize if our method can capture or track the path accurately. And the triangles are the initial states. You can see initially the ground truth and our initial state is pretty far from each other. But uh, as time evolves, as we accumulate or assimilate more and more data, we can capture the ground truth path accurately. And this is a highly chaotic system, which means if you lost tracking for a little bit, it would diverge, you'll never get it back. So which proves that we, our method can really have captured the keep tracking the, the high dimensional uh, state equation for the Lawrence 96 model in one million dimensional space. And here, here are the RMSE for some randomly selected dimensions, 1D, and here are the RMSE for the overall. So the reason why we show the path just because this RMSE, people really don't know what it means by, okay, I have 0.1 RMSE. People don't know how accurate that means. And we, we, we want to say, get 0.1 RMSE is pretty good for uh, tracking high dimensional dynamical systems, okay? And the, this is the scalability test of our method called ensemble score filter. Uh, the scalability, basically the time with respect to the dimension of the state system and the ensemble size. And uh, here, I will add a comment to your, to your question earlier, like uh, when we compute the score, we use a very small batch size because as long as we can keep tracking the dynamical system, the path, we don't need use a lot of data that will speed up the process. You don't need to compute the score very accurately. I don't need the score very, very, very accurate. So for example, every, because for each tracking, each, backward SDE or OD, I need to invent the score multiple times at, at a lot of time steps. And each time step, I can use a small portion of the randomly select, a mini batch of the, of the data to speed up the process. So I don't need a, to, be very, uh, to be very accurate. And of course, I, I didn't mention that, you know, the way we model the likelihood function has a bias. So, but so far, even though with the ocean models, we don't see a, a significant influence, a bad influence of the bias. Yeah, we can still keep tracking, even though there is a bias, but we'll still try to fix that bias. Uh, the reason you don't, want, you don't need to be very accurate is that because you, you have data at later time to correct. So, because I would think that if you, if, you, if you don't have the score computed correctly, then the error will accumulate over time. Yeah, to, because we, have, we keep but having new data. data. Yeah, we keep having new data. And, uh, and uh, there's another important aspect is like how often we have the, the frequency of incoming data. That's why we also study called the sparse observation. Like uh, in practice, usually the satellite to, a pro to scan this area maybe every six hours. So the time interval, uh, how often the, the new data will come in also uh, will determine like how accurate we need to approximate the posterior such that we can keep tracking the target. That's also, that's the, that's the time sparsity. And also there's a spatial sparsity basically for weather forecasting. There are only a limited number of weather stations or radar stations in the country. There are only like 150 of them in US. So each of them covers me, uh, like, a, uh, like several hundred uh, square miles, something like that. So we need to consider that the sparse observation, that's also, that's also a very important fact. That will also intertwine with the accuracy of, of the score estimation to make sure we have we don't lose tr lose tracking uh, the system. So, but uh, with a very small batch, we our our method can scale very well. But uh, if we use the full data, now the uh, of course it will drop. Yeah. So, and here is another example, which is the the, the benchmark problem that uh, NOAA and the European Weather Center use to test data simulation called SQG model. That's the very simple model. Uh, it's also a turbulent model that they use to test uh, data simulation al uh, algorithms. And here we have this model described, discretized on the 96 by 96 by two mesh. Each mesh point is an independent state variable. So we have a, a, a over 18,000 dimensional problem. And uh, we, want, we compare with the ENKF, which is the, called the localization, the LETKF uh, localized uh, ensemble transform comma filter. That is the state of art of ENKF. 
And we can see our method has a much, much smaller RMSE. These are the dynamics. Our estimation is very close to the true turbulence and the ENKF is totally off because we use, introduced a little bit of nonlinearity into in the in the observation data in the observation function, and also we want to increase some noise to the to the observation to the to the to the observations to see if our method can still handle it well. And it turns out when we introduce noise, it can still handle it pretty well for this uh, for this SQG model. And uh, one important yeah. So let me see. Yeah, this comparison with the in the in the noise setting we compare with the LETKF. One important the drawback of LETKF or ensemble common filter is that it requires a very dedicated fine tuning. So this is the two parameter space like localization scale and this RTPS is another parameter that we need to tune in ENKF. Usually they just say, okay, I do a two D grid search and I find the best one. It's very, the, the total error or the performance of LETKF is very, very sensitive to the parameters. So that's the drawback uh, in practice because in, in operation, what they told us is that once the model is fine tuned for such a specific setting, don't touch it. If you touch it, it will, it will blow up. So that's, that's, that's why they are surprised about the robustness of our method when we talk to them, when we show them the results, the, the, you know, the NOAA people. And here is another setting that we say, okay, the state is only partially observable. So we only observe it at 50% of these locations. And, and we, we run our model to see if we can capture the true state and our method. And we still compare with LETKF and our method still performs very well, much better than LETKF. And LETKF, no surprisingly, requires the, uh, the, the fine tuning. Which is not what we want. It's not is 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 it's not what we want. Okay, so I think that's about it. So basically, we propose those diffusion models. We start with the training free diffusion model for supervised learning to generate uh, samples of a static distribution, and we extend that to the Bayesian inference setting, and we then extend that to the conditional diffusion conditional probability setting. And then to the finally to the recursive patient, which is data simulation setting. And uh, we all see the good performance so far. And uh, right now we want to, we are doing something called joint state parameter estimation. Basically, if your model not only have state, but you also have unknown parameters, you can use the augmentation techniques to also estimate the, the parameters as well. And uh, we are also working on this uh, data simulation with very sparse observations, not only in space, but also in time. Basically, we enlarge the time interval between two observations comes in. So that would create a, 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 a challenge. And also data-driven control problem, like, like what the common filter is used. So basically, the, when you, before you do control, you can solve the data simulation problem to estimate the unknown states. And those states will be the feedback of the controller to generate the more uh, informative control actions. And we are also applying this to more complicated. SQG is the simplest model they have at NOAA. And we are moving up to a model that is closer to the operational model they use. Try to see if our method can still perform well. Eventually we want to get to their operational model uh, to, to test. Okay, I think that's it. And here is the, just a, 